Well, I'm Liz Wilson, and welcome to the Ali at SBU Lecture Series. Today we have Susan Steinman with us. Um, she's going to be talking about Langston Hughes. Um, Susan has been an Ali member for over eight or 10 years, and she's been uh, leading workshops for us. Um, five to five, how many years now, Susan? Five, six, seven years? Yeah. We lose track after a while. There you go. When you get <laughs> older, you lose track of time. <laughs> she, she's an educator. She's been an educator all her life. She's taught in elementary schools for over 30 years. And she mentioned to me that she's been a student of Langston Hughes poetry her entire life. And I'm sure she'll tell you more. But uh, we want to get started. So, Susan, you can take it away. Okay. I had originally called... Langston Hughes, the Walt Whitman of the African-American community. And the reason for that is a lot of academics fault him as a poet for not being uh, symbolic enough, not being uh, educated enough. They basically don't get him. They don't get what he was trying to do. And just like Walt Whitman, was writing, quote, for the common man. He's considered the poet of the common man. And he wanted poetry so everybody could access his poetry. Langston Hughes was writing for the people in his community, for the African-American community at large. And he wasn't writing for academics. He was writing for the ordinary people. So... Because of that, a number of biographers of him and those that are uh, academics and various kinds like him, but don't always really get what he is trying to do. Um, the people that he wrote for got what he was trying to do, but on a college level, sometimes um, if it wasn't complex enough, people thought that it was bad poetry, which he's probably the greatest poet of the 20th century, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm going to start out with an interview that was done um, with Alice Walker, another well-known poet, another well-known African-American poet, who's universally regarded, not just by African-Americans. And the other person in the interview is um, Mr. Rampersand, who is his primary biographer. And sometimes uh, he, you know, in some of the interviews I've heard with him, he's critical of Langston Hughes because he didn't feel that he was complex enough. And that's why I said, Sometimes uh, his biographers don't always quite get him. So Liz, would you play the first slide, please? Absolutely. One minute. Find him helping her in her in her teens and maintaining this connection with her for the rest Liz, of the Liz, you have to go back to the beginning. Or Margaret Walker, who Sorry. That's okay. There we go. Can you hear it? Now I do. Yes, thank you. He was born James Langston Hughes, February 1st, 1902, in Joplin, Missouri. And he wasn't there very long, went on to Lawrence, Kansas, which is where he spent a lot of his boyhood, most of his boyhood. One of the things that attracted me to Langston was the difficulty he had as a child um, because his parents were divorced and because their marriage had been a really rocky one. He was tossed about from one parent to the other from Cleveland to Mexico. He also spent a lot of time in Lawrence, Kansas with his aunt and uncle. Could you tell us something about uh, Langston Hughes' early life? Uh, what was his life like as a child? Langston lost his father, to all intents and purposes, when he was quite young. His father left the family, 
uh, being unable to make a, a living as uh, an attorney, which is what he wanted to be, unable to practice law because of the color of his skin, he went off first to Cuba and then to Mexico. So Langston really didn't know his father, except really as a kind of absence in his life, which was very hurtful. The other connection I felt reading him was that he had to have spent a lot of time alone um, recuperating from some of the stresses of being in this particular family. He connected with uh, nature. In fact, I recently was there and saw the river that runs through Lawrence that I understood that Langston had loved and had spent a good deal of time uh, looking at and, and feeling. So I think that actually he was supported by nature uh, when he could not feel supported by his parents. He grew up uh, mainly with his grandmother, uh, Mary Langston, his mother's uh, mother, in Lawrence, Kansas. And that, I think, is where uh, his consciousness, so to speak, was formed. What I love about the story of Langston and his grandmother uh, is that she reminded him uh, that his ancestors had fought against being enslaved, that they had not accepted it, and that his um, direct ancestor, his grandfather, Sheridan Leary, had really um, fought with, with John Brown against the institution of slavery. Langston was definitely uh, from a distinguished family. His grandmother's, his mother's mother's first husband, had died at Harpers Ferry fighting in John Brown's uh, band. And uh, her second husband was also a prominent abolitionist. Uh, and his brother, this is Charles Langston, Langston's grandfather, uh, Charles Langston's brother was perhaps one of the three best-known African Americans of the 19th century, a congressman uh, from Virginia and also an ambassador to Haiti and the Dominican Republic and so on. So he had this extremely distinguished background, Langston Hughes did, except that uh, he, his family was poor. Um, by the time he was growing up, they were almost destitute at times, uh, and this had a profound effect upon his, um, his, his, his sense of, of who he was. I understand his grandmother died when he was about 12, 13 years old. Yes, Langston's grandmother died in his very early teens um, when he was uh, 13 or thereabouts. Um, <coughs> and that, too, um, affected him, I think, quite strongly um, because although um, she was often silent uh, and, um, and perhaps uh, not forthcoming in her love for him, uh, she was still an important uh, guiding figure. And it was then, at that point, that I think uh, he spent several months with the, with the Reeds, uh, who had a profound effect, I think, on his, um, uh, on his sense of, uh, of, um, of his identity. Uh, the Reeds did not have children. Uh, they were a different kind of people altogether. She uh, was prominent in the local church. Uh, he did not go to church, but uh, he enjoyed life. Um, and they had a good time together. The Reeds showered love affection, encouragement on young Langston, and he absolutely basked in it. He really needed it. Keep reading in books. Why do you think religion was so important to uh, Auntie Reed? All day long, sinners coming to Christ. And I think that, that even when I was growing up uh, in, in a similar little town, well, actually not a little town, but way out in the country, uh, people really wanted us to be saved. It was important. It's very important to uh, religious communities, especially uh, black Southern Christian ones, that the children be, quote, saved. And so um, she was doing it because she loved him and because she wanted him to feel in himself um, some kind of protection, some kind of uh, uh, supernatural protection because the life of a black child then as now was in jeopardy uh, with every breath. So she felt that if you had Jesus to protect you, then you, you were saved. Her uh, religion, I think, was a much more fundamentalist kind of religion, a much more ecstatic kind of religion. Um, and I think it impressed him tremendously. Uh, the cries, the, 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 the singing, the promise of, uh, of um, a kind of immediacy uh, in the intervention of, uh, of God. This he didn't have in his, in his uh, I think, in his mother's religion, 
Um, so he found it, I think, very, very compelling. Was Langston damaged by this church experience? Uh, I, I don't think he was damaged. I think it was a great awakening. It, it was an awakening to the fact that other people uh, think of your salvation quite differently from the way you think of your salvation. We do know that, uh, that Langston had a severe view of religion. Um, he admired uh, the place of religion and recognized the place of religion in the black world, in the black community. Um, he admired the faith of, uh, of say, older uh, black women or men, um, but for, for he, he himself was not a believer. And, um, and he was also very um, angry about religious hypocrisy. His salvation, he was saved. He was saved from that kind of delusion that there is, in fact, a Jesus who's going to come to the bench, take you by the because it's all literal. You know, it's right. when I went to the Soviet Union, I, I had just gotten out of um, my freshman year at school, and I had been told so many times that there was an iron curtain, you know, right, right. that I, and, and I, to me, it was completely literal. And so when I actually got to the border between the Soviet Union and Finland, and the train stopped, I went out to see the Iron Curtain. Wow. <laughs> and what an awakening. Right. What an awakening. I, I said, you know, this is a delusion. You know, this is a lie. There is no Iron Curtain here. And to top it off, all of the Russian um, soldiers who, who came out to search the train or whatever were very kind. They were much better than the police I had left in Georgia. Where was Jesus? Where was he? Where was this light I was supposed to see? Why won't this boy come? What was I supposed to do? Pretend like Wesley? How, how did uh, Langston feel about Jesus failing him? Uh, we don't know for an absolute fact that this happened exactly the way it happened uh, in Langston's life. But it is a powerful scene, and, and it meant a great deal to Hughes, and he embedded it, in his embedded it in his autobiography early on so that we could get a sense of some important things about him. Um, uh, and I think he wanted to make a statement about his, his father, his parents, um, because they're sort of absent from the scene, with the Reeds being present. Um, it's a tribute to Auntie Reed, really, um, in, in many respects, and to Uncle Reed. Um, but of course, it is above all a picture of a boy uh, in, in a state of desolation. The chapter called Salvation in the Big Sea is often identified as a very uh, a piece of good writing that it was the prose was especially well conceived. Could you talk about that? Hughes's style in the autobiography, I think, is to offer us a succession of vignettes. Um, little tales, um, and this one I think is a beautifully rounded uh, little tale. I think it deals, as Hughes so often does, it deals with something that's profound, something that's extraordinarily sad, but it is treated in a light-hearted way, and that was the essence of Hughes. I mean, he connects uh, that uh, aspect of his aesthetic to the blues. Uh, the blues is about uh, sad uh, events, but when they are sung, he says, people laugh. Uh, and both of them, this, this, the singing or the playing and the laughter, amount to a real victory over the sadness. Um, so that's part of the structuring of, of the story. What I love to point out to people, too, is the absolute beauty of Hughes's prose uh, in, in its simplicity. It is, I think, uh, the most fundamentally American kind of prose uh, you, can, you can get. There's no pretense whatsoever no use of high Latin phrases, no turns and twists of expressions, no cuteness, no smartness. It is direct, it is clear, pellucid, honest, and therefore, uh, maybe it's too much of a compliment, but I think it's very American then, in the sense of Whitman and Hemingway uh, also having the same desire to write a kind of clear prose uh, that they believe is un-European and is peculiarly American. Do you think you could... Uh address how did he become a writer? What, was that a choice easily made or difficult for him? Or? Well, he himself in, in the Big C, uh, Hughes does, uh, talks about uh, reading the uh, French writer Guy de Maupassant in French and struggling with it as a schoolboy. And then one day, 
um, he is reading um, de Maupassant and it is snowing in the text and then it begins to snow outside his window and suddenly he is be able to understand the French and enter into the beauty of the writing and he says that there and then he decided that he would become a writer like de Maupassant because he recognized the sort of power of, uh, of writing to, to preserve an age and to speak for a situation and sometimes to speak for a people. And he said that there and then he decided that he would be a writer and write about African American uh, stories that people would re and poems that people would remember generations hence. Books were around him all the time. Um, he talks about the library, loving the library in Topeka and also in Lawrence. Um, so I think it wasn't a far stretch for him to, um, to become a writer. Hughes did not want to use words as weapons. And he also, while he was a radical at certain points in his life, he, he believed in art, and that was uh, his identity, really, his public identity from beginning to end, an artist. The Harlem Renaissance is something that I think uh, people are very interested in what it was. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Uh, as I understand the Harlem Renaissance, it was a time when uh, African American writers and artists and musicians flourished. And not only that, Harlem itself was wonderful. It's hard to believe, you know, that Harlem was this thriving, safe, beautiful, actively uh, engaged community of very uh, lively, happy people, for the most part. Um, and so, of course, art flourished there because there was so much life. In, in 1926, Hughes published an essay called The Negro Artist on the Racial Mountain in, a, in the very prestigious Nation magazine. Uh, and it, that stands as a kind of manifesto for the Harlem Renaissance. It emphasizes, one, uh, that the younger writers had um, a sense of, uh, of, uh, of themselves, a sense of identity uh, that was distinct from the older writers, the old African-American writers. Uh, the younger writers believed in, I would say, two things above all as far as Hughes was concerned. Uh, they believed in racial identification to some extent, and they also believed in freedom. Uh, freedom from worrying about what uh, um, what middle class people thought about their work or, or white people thought of their work or religious people thought of their work. So there was this emphasis on race and on freedom and Hughes stressed both. I think that's why so much art came out of that period. People, black people, were having uh, their first uh, taste of any kind of freedom and autonomy in the country. Langston Hughes more than articulated the needs of uh, African American people. Uh, as an artist, he did more than that. He showed them what they looked like, how they were artic articulating their needs and concerns, and he showed them, you know, what was not such a good face to present and what was uh, a very good face, you know. Uh, and he showed them, you know that poem by um, County Cullen about uh, how African Americans are often required to have two faces? Yes, we wear the know? mask. And, um, and I think Langston's work showed them what it meant uh, to try to keep the mask off, you know, because if you have two faces, one is often a mask. And so his work, he worked very hard to say to black people, you don't have to wear the mask at all, just the way you are, it's just fine. Mm -hmm. And that's a lovely thing, especially in those times. In that sense, he was uh, an artist of the, of the highest caliber. In a way, what it is that I, I respect so much about his work is his devotion. He had enough faith in himself. I mean, I think he knew that some of his poetry was kind of not so terrific, but what he really believed in was leaving um, this body of work that would actually say to people many years later, you know, a century or two later, uh, this was a particular community. They struggled on to, you know, to have a good life uh, in the middle of some incredible uh, depression. And, th and this is the beauty, and this is the humor, and this is the joy, and this is, this is what they created. You can find, that you, if you read all of his work, uh, like Zora Neale Hurston, you can find a complete community. And that is very unusual.
Hughes had a, a, a tremendous sense of devotion to the word, a sense of duty as an artist, obligation to his craft, obligation to his audience. It's something, it's one of the most spectacular stories, really, in African American and perhaps e even in American literature. Uh, he was the first African American to live by his or her writings, and, um, and, and he did so sometimes at enormous personal cost to himself. But he kept going because um, he believed that uh, any kind of dilution of his, of his energies away from writing um, uh, would, be, would, not, would not be uh, true to, you know, to his sense of duty. I understand that Langston wrote most often when he was the most unhappy, that it came out of his unhappiness. Well, it was a famous British poet, I think it was Shelley, who said, our sweetest songs are those which t tell of saddest thought. Uh, so I think the idea is out there always that there is this association between sadness and creativity, between pain and creativity. I think for writers, stress can be a great friend and sadness can be a very, very great friend. It's because when you are sad, you go to deeper parts of yourself and to, into hidden chambers. And Langston had many of those. And um, I think because his childhood was so fractured, uh, because his father basically rejected him, uh, and because his mother never understood, really, that he, he was a writer, but, and he wrote books, but he didn't have much money, and she was always, you know, very much in need. Uh, Hughes is a difficult person to talk about in this way because uh, he puts such an emphasis on laughter, on smiling through. Um, but he does tell us at a certain point that, w that he could write poetry when he was sad. He was not able to write poetry uh, when he was happy. Uh, this could be true or could be sometimes true of him. I don't know. Um, but he had sufficient sadness in his life. And I think he was often misunderstood. I think when he went off into um, politics, for instance, uh, and especially he was very much in favor of communism as he experienced it in the Soviet Union. Well, that didn't play well here, uh, even though anyone looking at his background could clearly understand why, if he went to a country where they treated him like a human being, you know, he would be enchanted. The important thing for him always was to triumph over that sadness. Um, he used it to create um, he used his sense of, uh, of social oppression and deprivation to create a certain kind of poetry. Uh, he used the kind of cosmic sense of existential sense of pain, but which he also had, that had nothing to do with, with race or politics in a way, to create another kind of poetry. Um, but as I keep saying, you know, the end with Hughes always is to affirm the human, and, and that's what his, his body of work does above all, I think. I understand that he helped other writers on the way up and brought them into the fold of African-American literature. He was very concerned about, about that. Yes, as, as soon as Hughes was able to uh, be of any assistance to, to younger writers, um, he certainly did his best to encourage them. I mean, if one looks at the career of uh, a great poet um, such as um, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, you find him helping her in her, in her teens and uh, maintaining this connection with her for the rest of, uh, of his life, uh, or Margaret Walker, who in 1942 won the Yale Younger Poets Prize. Uh, Hughes knew her too as a teenager, uh, set aside time to work with her, um, encouraged her. When I um, went to visit Langston right. Hughes in Harlem, and it was a very different Harlem, though he continued to love it, I think, just the same, which again is, is, is that devotion that he had. Uh, he was living in um, a townhouse, it seemed to be a townhouse, that he shared with uh, friends or relatives, I, I didn't know. And his own space seemed very modest, and uh, all I remember really is that when he asked me which of his books I liked, um, very honestly, I said, I haven't read a single one. And he never missed a beat. He just reached behind him, <laughs> as if he'd done this many times, to a cabinet and then turned around and took out copies of, you know, everything he'd written, put them in my arms. And um, I thought, there are not many people with that kind of grace, you know, once you tell them that 
you haven't read anything, right. you don't know anything, who are they, you know, why am I here, you know, but he was very graceful, and uh, I really appreciated it. I was really young, and he could have said things that were very hurtful, but he didn't. He was, he was wonderful. Here we are in a new century, 21st century. Langston has become so popular he's on a postage stamp. Uh, what do you think that tells us about his place in uh, African American literature and American literature as a whole uh, in today's world? I think he has a lot to say to Americans um, and to other peoples for that matter about, about life and about poetry, about art. Um, uh, whether or not he will continue to be, his work will continue to be respected, um, as always, um, depends on the people who, who admire him and admire his work. His literature, of course, is priceless. You know, that's a given. You, you may not like this or you like that or, you know, pick and choose because there's so much. I mean, he, he worked in many genres. Everyone's uh, eventual success, uh, fame, uh, is dependent on uh, you know teachers and uh, parents uh, passing on the word to younger people uh, that here is a body of work that is uh, you know, worth looking at. So, but at the moment, uh, teachers I think are very fond of Langston Hughes. His poetry communicates uh, very well uh, to younger people, very young people. Um, there's a great body of work uh, that he left behind. There's something to please if not everyone, well, many people. Um, so I think that, that, um, that his work is likely to endure insofar as we could look ahead. Thank you, Dr. Rampasant, for spending your time with us and taking a moment to share Langston Hughes' life and what you know about him. Thank you so much. Liz, you could turn off this particular one. Right. OK, um, any comments at this point? Feel free to unmute yourself. We don't have a big group, so you can just unmute and ask a question. Or make a comment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if not, Liz, could you please go to slide four? Okay, slide four. Yep. This is The Negro Speaks of Rivers, one of my earliest poems written in 1920, just after I came out of high school. The way this poem came to be written was that I was going to Mexico to visit my father, who lived in Mexico City, and on the train going across the Mississippi River, just outside St. Louis, I looked out the window and I saw this great muddy river flowing down toward the heart of the south, and I began to think about what this river meant to the Negro people, how, in a sense, our history was linked to this river, how in slavery time, my grandmother told me that to be sold down the Mississippi was one of the worst things that could happen to a Negro slave, and then a uh, I remembered that I'd read about Abraham Lincoln going down the Mississippi as a young man, and he went on a raft to New Orleans, and he saw human beings bought and sold in the slave market there, and he was so horrified by this that he never forgot it. And many years later, of course, we know that it was Lincoln who signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And so uh, as the train went on into the gathering dusk, because... It had been about sunset when we crossed the river. I took my father's letter out of my pocket and began to write down on the back of his letter this poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo, and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I have seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, 
dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Um, are there any comments about um, the poem? Anything that occurs to you about this poem? Okay, you could you could either unmute and give your comment or go to the reactions um, part on Zoom and put your hand up. Okay. Anybody? All right. I wanted, let me just look in the view so I can see the gallery. If anybody has their hand up. No? No, um, nobody does. Mm -mm. Okay. So let me say something about Langston Hughes' um, poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. Um, he was one of the earliest people way before his time to talk to connect African Americans with Africa. He mentions the Congo in this poem and the Nile. And he was really ahead of his time. The poets of the Harlem Renaissance called themselves the New Negro. And the reason why they considered themselves new was because they valued, they talked about their history and their lives and their struggles and they valued it. They put it out there for people to see and read about and share, which had not, other than Du Bois, the souls of black folk, um, there weren't a lot of raiders who were on the same page as the poets of the Harlem Renaissance. So to that extent, if you look later in the 60s, where the black power movement developed and the whole idea of black is beautiful, Langston Hughes was way, way ahead of his time. Okay, I want to go, let me just see, Oh, uh, let's see here. I want to go to slide five, which is another poem. And um, if you would open that, Liz, slide five. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody'll dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful we are and be ashamed. I too am America. This is another poem where he talks about the beauty of the African-American people. And he loved his community. He loved his community locally in Harlem and he loved his broader community, the African-American community. He wrote a column for a number of the African-American newspapers, but he also saw his community as much larger as worldwide, including the people in Africa who were struggling in the mines in Johannesburg and a lot of other places that he mentions in his poems. Um, are there any comments at all so far? Oh, we have something in the chat, let me see. Okay, people could type questions in the chat if they, feel more comfortable doing that. And let me just, okay, well, here is a section about the Harlem Renaissance. And Liz, could you please play slide number three? Uh, we do have a question from Joan Burke. Her, her hand oh, is- Oh, good, very good. 
Um, hi, um, it's really not a question. I just wanted to comment on the poem. Um, I'm not that familiar with Langston Hughes and I intend to become a little bit more familiar. Um, your enthusiasm is infectious. Um, but I found that poem very hopeful. It, it, there was a hopefulness and, and, I, and it sort of gravitated my thoughts towards Martin Luther King with his, I had a dream, I have a dream. Um, you know, of course, many, many years later, but um, despite everything, there was a, uh, I just, there was a spark of, uh, of true hopefulness. I just wanted to make that comment. No, I think that's a very correct observation because Langston Hughes never gave up on America. Even when he flirted with socialism or communism or whatever ism he flirted with, um, he was always very hopeful about more justice coming in this country. And that hope can be seen in his poetry. Kathleen, would you like to unmute yourself and share your comment? Um, yeah, this is just an aside. Um, Hughes was also good friends with Zora Neale Hurston, who was also part of the, the Harlem Renaissance. And the two of them shared a patron, uh, a rich white woman, I, I don't recall her name, uh, and she was very supportive, very into African-American culture, although she could be controlling. I know Hurston eventually broke with her and, you know, ended up really poor at the end. I don't, I don't know about uh, Hugh's situation. Maybe you do. But just I just wanted to share that. No, I think that's true. I think her name was uh, Vanderveen or something like that. I re read that also, but my memory is not what it should be. <laughs> Mine isn't either. <laughs> yeah. But at any rate, uh, I think at a certain point, Langston Hughes broke with her as well because he was able to live off the proceeds of his writing. He mainly uh, had her patron, He pat she patronized him while he was just more getting started. The, the Harlem Renaissance lasted, you know, over a period of time. And in the early point of the Harlem Renaissance, Harlem was a flowering, I'm going to show in the slide, it had a flowering of culture in the 20s and late 20s. But what happened in the 30s was um, because of the depression, a lot of people who had emigrated from the South for a better future in Harlem and had had a better future, when the depression hit, you know, last hired, first fired. So they were laid off and they were economically distraught again. So the depression sort of um, destroyed the progress that the people in Harlem had made. And, you know, this, the Harlem Renaissance after that, uh, it lasted a, a while longer, but the main period of the Harlem Renaissance was during the period of prosperity. Now, let me see, we have another comment, I think. Yeah. Let me look and see who has their hand up or, oh, Naria, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm a retired special ed teacher. I've worked with underprivileged kids uh, for my career. And I had that poem that he just did, I Too Am America, was definitely, I mean, my students loved it. I always did it. I always taught it. We always, uh, they so appreciate it because they themselves were separated not just by their race, but they were separated because of their special needs as well. So I think it certainly spoke to them. And, and we know that, I think that uh, it's kind of an assurance that this work will endure and it will be around for a long time and, and speak to the people who feel excluded from. And, and I believe that um, Langston Hughes was a speaker for the underdog. In one of his writings, right. I read about he was very um, disturbed by the treatment of Jews in the Soviet Union. This huh. was in the 50s. So wow. he identified with whoever the underdog was because of his own status in mm -hmm. the country. Right. Uh, Elise, go ahead, please. 
unmute yourself. Thank you, Elise. Hello. Uh, I'm not sure when would be the, I hope you can hear me. Yes. I'm not oh, sure yes. when would be the right time to show this, but my father knew Langston uh, at, in, um, at Lincoln University and he uh, inscribed two books uh, for my dad and my mom, whose name also was Elise. And this says, for Nick and Elise, Happy New Year from Langston, New York, December 31st, 1944. Oh, that's a treasure. And then also, uh, that's Shakespeare in Harlem. And this one, a montage of a dream deferred. Um, <laughs> he says, um, for Nick and Elise, with all good wishes ever, sincerely likes New York, March 11th, 1959. That's, that's um, beautiful. I plan to donate these to the Schomburg. Oh, that's, well, thank you for that. That's wonderful. You know, he's, uh, that's a treasure, you know. Yes. Yeah, yes. it is, and and God bless you for for taking good care of it. For you know, yes. it. <laughs> now my 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 dad uh, and mom mentioned him, uh, but I don't remember. You know, I don't remember uh, what they said and the significance and all of that. I wish I had paid more attention, uh, but I didn't know. You know, at that, and I have a couple of his. Uh, books also the panther and the lash oh. and, um, also the, the first book of negroes by langston hughes pictures by ursula curring this is um, right that uh, was a book for uh, more for teenagers yes for for, for uh, uh this franklin watts uh let's see the the date gee doesn't have a date that's that's a very prized book now oh. 1952. Yeah, it's out of print. And, it's out of uh, print. I, yes. uh, it's interesting. They republished the Pan Panther and the Lash. Uh -huh. uh, I have the old copy of it because I bought it when I was young. But they recently republished it, and I bought the new copy also. Uh, my old copy is all dog-eared and annotated, and it has little scribbles in the margin. So, uh, yeah. So I wanted to uh, go with any other questions or comments. No. Okay. I wanted to go into a little more description of the Harlem Renaissance because it didn't just include writing. Um, Liz, would you please play slide three? African-Americans from across the country flooded New York City's Harlem neighborhood, leading to a cultural explosion of books, poetry, music, and art that's now collectively known as the Harlem Renaissance. As special correspondent Jared Bowen from WGBH in Boston reports, a photography exhibit now traces the evolution of one of the nation's most recognized neighborhoods as it continues to evolve today. It's part of our series on arts and culture, Canvas. The 19-teens saw the start of the Great Migration, when millions of African Americans moved from the South, many to the North, and to Harlem, which became an oasis from oppression, especially for artists. Stephanie Sparling Williams is the exhibition's curator. The art was important then in creating a new visual lexicon for African Americans against histories of dehumanizing and degrading stereotypes and imagery in the American popular imagination. At the Addison Gallery of American Art, we find representation of nearly 100 years of life in Harlem, mostly in photographs from the museum's collection. The show takes us from the 1930s, just after the Harlem Renaissance, to today. I see vibrance. I see a people who have been through so much and were given so little and have made this out of it, this miraculous, this place. A lot of people describe Harlem as a cultural mecca. And this is where a lot of the socializing happened, was out on street corners or in front of shops. The Harlem of the 1930s was a place reeling from the Great Depression. And William sees in the work of both black and white photographers a place of fortune 
and despair. You see a tension between um, Harlem's working class, the unemployed, and then also Harlem's upper and middle class um, citizens, stuck within Harlem, but all trying to pick up the pieces. By the 1960s, Harlem had become a hotbed of protest in America, fueled in large part by its community of artists, says Judith Dolcart, the Addison's director. I, mean, I always see artists as active agents in the culture, so artists have the ability to change the culture as much as anyone else. They have a point of view, and they are putting a point of view out there. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, Harlem's streets were host to civil rights marches and later black power rallies. It brought an energy that Williams says courses through these photographs. I describe it as a buzz, the sound when you get off the subway of just people in the streets. And I think that's captured throughout the exhibition, not only the built environment and people, but how both come together to create the social life of Harlem, the lifeblood of the neighborhood itself. Today, Harlem tells a different story, the results of gentrification. A way of life is changing, as it always has, but now, so are Harlem's people. It comes into sharp focus through Dawood Bey's series, Harlem Redux, which he shot in 2016. When we see um, the development, the construction, we see the different ways in which space is being claimed by other bodies, particularly white bodies. The show ends on an epic piece by Kahinde Wiley, who created this instantly famous portrait of President Barack Obama. The subject, regal and wielding a sword on his equally mighty horse, was straight off 125th Street in Harlem. It's carrying along this tradition of um, self-determined imagery, but also there's a tension, right? This, this tension between the art historical canon, this, this genre that African Americans would never find themselves in. The black body was never portrayed in these heroic um, paintings that depicted valor and masculinity and virility often. But Wiley shows us that the black figure is no less powerful, no less masculine. And instead, there is glory in a neighborhood that has long encouraged that in its residents. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jared Bowen of WGBH in Boston. Thank you. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little in my presentation and read a poem because it really fits in here. This was written during the Depression, and it shows a couple of things. It shows Langston Hughes' sense of humor. It was written in 1931 and published in the New Masses. And it was during the period where he um, was looking at you know, various radical ideas to end the Jim Crow that he had known uh, in his life. Um, and that will come up later. But it, it's a really, I, I find this, of, of, you will see, uh, it's called Advertisement for the Waldorf Astoria. Fine living a la carte. Listen, hungry ones. Look, see what Vanity Fair has to say about the new Waldorf Astoria. All the luxuries of private home. Now, won't that be charming when the last flop house has turned you down this winter? Furthermore, it is far beyond anything hitherto attempted in the hotel world. It cost $28 million. The famous Oscar Cherky is in charge of banqueting. Alexandra Gaston is chef. It will be a distinguished background for society. So when you've got no place else to go, homeless and hungry ones, choose the Waldorf as a background for your rags. Or do you still consider the subway after midnight good enough? Rumors. Take a room at the new Waldorf, you down and outers, sleepers and charities, flop houses, where God pulls a long face and you have to pray to get a bed. 
they serve you swell board at the Waldorf Astoria. Look at this menu, will you? Gumbo Creole, crab meat in cassolette, boiled brisket of beef, small onions in cream, watercress salad, peach melba. Have luncheon there this afternoon, all you jobless. Why not? Dine with some of the men and women who got rich off your labor who clip coupons with clean white fingers because your hands dug coal, drilled stone, sewed garments, poured steel to let other people draw dividends and live easy. Or haven't you had enough yet of the soup lines and the bitter bread of charity? Walk through Peacock Alley tonight before dinner and get warm anyway. You've got nothing else to do. Evicted families, all you families put out in the street. Apartments in the towers are only $10,000 a year. Three rooms and two baths. Move in there until times get good and you can do better. 10,001 are about the same to you, aren't they? Who cares about money with a wife and kids homeless and nobody in the family working? Wouldn't a duplex high above the street be grand with a view of the richest city in the world at your nose? A lease if you prefer, or an arrangement terminable at will. Negroes, oh Lord, I done forgot Harlem. Say you colored folks hungry a long time in 135th Street. They got swell music at the Waldorf Astoria. It sure is a mighty nice place to shake hips in too. There's a dancing after supper in a big warm room. It's cold as hell on Lenox Avenue. All you've had all day is a cup of coffee. Your pawn shop overcoats a ragged banner on your hungry frame. You know, downtown folks are just crazy about Paul Robeson. Maybe they'll like you too, black mob from Harlem. Drop in at the Waldorf this afternoon for tea. Stay to dinner. Give Park Avenue a lot of darky color, free for nothing. Ask the junior leaguers to sing a spiritual for you. They probably know them better than you do, and their lips won't be so chapped with cold after they step out of their closed cars in the undercover driveways. Hallelujah, undercover driveways. My soul's a witness for the Waldorf Astoria. A thousand nigga section hands keep the roadbed smooth. So investments in rail modes pay ladies with diamond necklaces staring at cert murals. Thank God almighty. And a million black bodies bend their backs on rubber plantations for rich behinds to ride on thick tires to the theater guild tonight. My soul's a witness. And here we stand Shivering in the cold in Harlem. Glory be to God. The Waldorf story is open. Everybody. So get proud and rear back everybody. The new Waldorf story is open. Special siding for private <clears throat> cars from the railroad yards. You ain't been there yet. A thousand miles of carpet and a million bathrooms. What's the matter? You haven't seen the ads in the papers? Didn't you get a card? Don't you know they specialize in American cooking? Angle on down to 49th Street at Park Avenue. Get up off that subway bench tonight with the Evening Post for cover. Come on out of that flop house. Stop shivering your guts out all day on street corners under the elevated. Aren't you tired yet? Hail Mary Christmas card. 
Hail Mary, Mother of God, the new Christ child of the revolutions about to be born. Hick hard red baby in the bitter womb of the mob. Somebody put an ad in Vanity Fair quick. Call Oscar of the Waldorf, for God's sake. It's almost Christmas. And that little girl turned poor because her belly was too hungry to stand it anymore. Wants a nice clean bed for the immaculate conception. Listen, Mary, mother of God, wrap your newborn babe in the red flag of revolution. The Waldorf Astoria's the best manger we've got. For reservations, telephone, EL5-3000. Any comments? Let me just see if anybody has their hand up. Okay, and this, this kind of poem in the 30s is why Langston Hughes got in trouble in the 50s. But I am quick to remind you that the, the differentiation between the haves and the have-nots was very, very bleak in the 30s. Okay, let's see, do we have a comment in the chat? Joe, Joe writes, De development still favors the wealthy at the expense of and results in the eviction of the poor. That's true. That, that is true. Elise, go ahead, please. Um, it just says it all, and it's still true. You know, it could be about um, any big hotel now, newer than the Waldorf. <laughs> it's still true. It's still true. It's absolutely true. And what I found I loved about this poem, though, I just loved it. It shows you what a sense of humor Langston had, but it wasn't a sense of humor, ha ha, laugh, laugh. Right, right. It was the kind of laughter that the blues song speaks about of, I laugh just to keep from crying. Right. Because this is depicting the terrible suffering that happened to people during the depression. Because if white people, during the depression suffered, black people suffered even more. And uh, I'd like to now, let me just, are there any other comments? Let me just look and see anybody, uh, other hands up. Okay. Um, I'd like to now go to slide number in a second slide number 16 please sure have you ever been a believer in communism My feeling, sir, is that I have believed in the entire philosophies of the left at one period in my life, including socialism, communism, Trotskyism. All isms have influenced me one way or another. This is actual testimony. Now, Mr. Hughes, do you remember writing this? Good morning, revolution. You are the very best friend I've ever had. We are going to pile around together from now on. Yes, sir, I wrote that. Did you write this? Put one more S in the USA to make it Soviet. The USA, when we take control, will be the USSA then. Yes, sir, I wrote that. Were you kidding when you wrote those things? What did you mean by those? To give you a full interpretation of any piece of literary work, one has to consider what brought it into being. I, sir, was born a Negro, 
from my very earliest childhood memories, I have encountered very hurtful problems. One of my earliest memories was going to the movies in Lawrence, Kansas. One afternoon, I put my nickel down and the woman pushed it back and she pointed to a sign. The sign said, colored not admitted. It was my first revelation of the division between the American citizens. My playmates, who were white and lived next door to me, could go to that motion picture, and I could not. In the first grade, my mother worked for a lawyer. Being a working woman, naturally she wanted to send me to the nearest school, and they would not let me go to the school. My mother had to go to the school board, and finally, after some time, she got me into the school. I had been there only a few days when the teacher made unpleasant and derogatory remarks about Negroes. Some of my schoolmates stoned me on the way home from school. My father and my mother were not together. When I got old enough to learn why, again, it was the same thing. My father, shortly after I was born, had studied law. He applied for permission to take the bar, and they would not permit him. A Negro evidently could not take the examinations. I missed my father. I learned he had gone away to another country because of prejudice here. When I finally met my father at the age of 17, he said, never go back to the United States. Negroes are fools to live there. I didn't believe that. I loved the country I had grown up in. I was concerned with the problems and I came back here. And so my interest in whatever may be considered political has been born out of this whole problem of myself, segregated, poor, colored, and how I can adjust to this whole problem of helping to build America when sometimes I cannot even get into a school or a lecture or a concert or in the South go to the library and get a book out. Could you make it briefer, please? A critical work goes out of a very deep background. It does not come in a moment. I am perfectly willing to come back and give it to you later, if you are tired. No, we will sit here as long as you want to go on. But you are missing the point completely. Will you give us some straightforward answers? Did you ever in your life desire the Soviet form of government over here? That is a very simple question, Mr. Hughes, for a man who wrote the things you did, and we have just started. Thank you, Liz. So that shows the consequences of some of the poetry that he wrote, which he wrote the poems that are talked about in the 30s, but they question him about these things in the 50s. And uh, I guess Mr. Cohn didn't like his explanation at all. And uh, he just wanted a simple answer. I don't think there's a simple answer to uh, the history of America, unfortunately. Um, let me just see now which one. Okay. Another aspect of Langston Hughes' poetry. Somebody mentioned the hopefulness that is in the poetry. Uh, I have a tape of Viola Davis reading. Uh, she's one, awesome. Oh, is there a comment? I'm sorry. Who, who, who would like to comment? Thanks, Mariah. Yes, go ahead, please. I just said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was being heard. But oh, I was uh, delighted okay. to hear that it's Viola Davis, but go oh. ahead. Yeah, no, it's Viola Davis. And let me just, uh, okay. And this particular poem is being read by her and it shows his hopefulness. Liz, would you please uh, play slide nine? Well, son, I'll tell you. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It 
It's had tacks in it. And splinters. And boards torn up. And places with no carpet on the floor. Bare. But all the time I's been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps cause you find it's kinda hard. Don't you fall now. Fires are still going, honey. Eyes are still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Thank you, Liz. Comments. Okay. Any comments at all? Let me, okay, very good. Let me just continue. The original um, tape that I showed with Alice Walker talked about Hugh's love for nature. I have a poem that is an example of that. So Liz, would you please play slide seven? April Rain Song. Liz, I, like I can't you. see it. Let me try again. Yeah. Slide seven. Yep. Thank you. April Rain Song by Langston Hughes. Let the rain kiss you. Could you make it large? Let the rain beat upon your head. I'm sorry. It is That's... large. Can everybody see it on the screen? Oh. It's probably your screen, Sis. Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Head with silver liquid drops. Let the rain sing you a lullaby. The rain makes still pools on the sidewalk. The rain makes running pools in the gutter. The rain plays a little sleep song on our roof at night. And I love the rain. Thank you. That was one of his nature poems. And uh, it really shows he, he was a very well-rounded individual and a well-rounded writer. He didn't only write about politics or uh, write about the life around him. Another thing that he very much loved was the music in Harlem. Uh, a lot of critics have noticed that he not only tries to pick up the language of those around him, but he also has rhythm in his poetry that comes from jazz. He went to a lot of the jazz clubs in Harlem and even um, read some poetry with famous musicians like Duke Ellington and others. He, he really loved music, and you can see a lot of jazz in his poetry. So I want, let me just see which slide that is. Okay. Okay, um, could you please play slide 12, slide 12 list. is one of Langston Hughes.
Hughes' most famous works. It is likely the most common Hughes poem taught in American schools. Written in 1951, it addresses one of Hughes' most common themes, the limitations of the American dream for African Americans. The poem has 11 short lines in four stanzas, and all but one line are questions. Hughes titled this poem Harlem after the New York neighborhood that became the center of the Harlem Renaissance, a major creative blossoming of music, literature, and art in the 1910s and 1920s. Many African-American families saw Harlem as a sanctuary from the frequent discrimination they faced in other parts of the country. Unfortunately, Harlem's glamour faded at the beginning of the 1930s when the Great Depression set in, leaving many who had prospered in Harlem destitute once more. The poem begins with the famous line, What happens to a dream deferred? A sense of silence follows this powerful question, created in part by the white space on the page. The speaker does not refer to a specific dream, but suggests the difficulty of dreaming or aspiring to great things due to the oppressive environment surrounding black America. In the three stanzas that follow, the speaker, a black person, perhaps the poet or a professor, muses on the fate of this dream deferred. He wonders if it dries up like a raisin in the sun, or if it oozes like a wound and then runs. It might smell like rotten meat or develop a sugary crust. It might just sag like a heavy load or it might explode. The verbs in the poem, drying up, festering, oozing, stinking, and crusting over, create potent images allowing the reader to smell, feel, and taste these discarded dreams. A dream deferred does not simply vanish. Rather, it undergoes an evolution, approaching a physical state of decay. The last line of the poem, or does it explode, stands out because it is italicized. It invites many interpretations. The explosion could refer to the riots in Harlem of 1935 and 1943, or more generally, the way that oppressive conditions inevitably led to open and overt rebellion. In a figurative sense, the explosion also suggests the explosion or undoing of a cultural myth or the overturning of a deeply held belief. Hughes was intimately aware of the challenges he faced as a black man in America, and this poem reflects his complicated experience. Thank you, Liz. Oh, let's see. Alrighty. Okay. Check. Something here. Liz, would you please play slide thirteen? Langston did an introduction in this book, The Best of Simple by Langston Hughes. I would like to share that with you. I cannot truthfully state, as some novelists do at the beginning of their books, that these stories are about nobody living or dead. The facts are that these tales are about a great many people, although they are stories about no specific person as such. But it is impossible to live in Harlem and not know at least a hundred simples 50 Joyce's, 25 Zaritas, a number of Boyd's, and several Cousin Minnie's, or reasonable facsimiles thereof. Simple Speaks His Mind had hardly been published when I walked into a Harlem cafe one night, and the proprietor said, listen, I don't know where you got that character just be simple, but I want you to meet one of my customers who is just like him. He called to a fella at the end of the bar, Watch how he walks, he said, exactly like simple. And I'll bet he won't be talking to you two minutes before he'll tell you how long he's been standing on his feet and how much his bunions hurt, just like your book begins. The barman was right. 
Even as the customer approached, he cried, man, my feet hurt. If you want to see me, why don't you just come over here where I am? I stands on my feet all day. And I stand on mine all night, said the barman, without me saying a word. A conversation began so much like the opening chapter in my book that even I was a bit amazed to see how nearly life can be like fiction or vice versa. Simple as a character originated during the war. His first words came directly out of the mouth of a young man who lived just down the block from me. One night I ran into him in a neighborhood bar and he said, come on back to the booth and meet my girlfriend. I did and he treated me to a beer. Not knowing much about the young man, I asked where he worked. He said, in a war plant. I said, what do you make? He said, cranks. I said, what kind of cranks? He said, oh man, I don't know what kind of cranks. I said, well, do they crank cars, tanks, buses, planes, or what? He said, I don't know what them cranks crank. Whereupon his girlfriend, a little bit out at this ignorance of his job, said, You've been working there long enough. Look like by now you ought to know what them cranks crank. Oh, woman, he said. You know white folks don't tell colored folks what cranks crank. That was the beginning of simple. I have long laughed. Thank you. Okay, I have a number. Uh, if you want to read more of the life of Jesse B. Semple, also known as Simple, um, Simple Speaks His Mind is a good book to pick up because as we mentioned, Langston not only wrote poetry, he wrote plays, he wrote prose, he wrote just about everything that can be written. But I wanted to allow time for comments at the end and uh, discussion. So impressions, thoughts, discussion, comments, Please speak by either unmuting yourself or raising your virtual hand under reactions. Hmm. Yes, Elise. Um, <clears throat> when reading his poetry, um, I'm I'm not a, a an expert, but the what is the the type of structure of his poems where parts of it rhyme and then parts of it do not rhyme and then sometimes he goes back to the rhyming part but it may not be quite the same as the original rhyming part etc back and forth thank you yes there there are many kinds of structures he has um when he's writing in the vernacular um a lot of uh, a lot of rhythm creeps in you know he he sometimes uses rhyme he sometimes doesn't um very often he uses rhythm that he gets from the jazz that he listened to but when he's writing um a poem that's more serious like he wrote a poem about a black youth that was shot in york yorkville in I think it was 1964. Uh, it was called, How Many Bullets Does It Take to Kill um, a Boy? Um, that is not, um, that is a lot of rhyme in that poem because he wants to make it tight. He doesn't want it to flow so much. He doesn't want it to feel, um, I think, um, relaxing. He wants to circumscribe it and make everybody very focused on the message that he's giving. Um, so that's my answer is it very much depends on the poem that he's writing, on the mood he wants to create. He wrote so much that he used many different kinds of devices in his poetry. Any other comments or questions? I don't see anything in the chat or anywhere. Okay, then um, let me continue with the number of, of tapes I have. You remember that I talked about um, during the depression, um, how bad it was, especially for um, African-American people. Um, you know, 
many white people have a certain image of President Roosevelt in terms of the progressive nature of his WPA solutions to the depression. But unfortunately, in many cases, some of those did not trickle down to a lot of black people. Liz, could you please play slide 14? This is extraordinary group read by oh. Go ahead. Danny Glover. Extraordinary group of black writers and artists. And one of the most challenging voices was that of poet Langston Hughes. Here is his 19, 1934 poem, Ballad of Roosevelt. The pot was empty, the cupboard was bare. I said, Papa, what's the matter here? I'm waiting on Roosevelt's son, Roosevelt, Roosevelt, waiting on Roosevelt's son. The rent was due and the lights were out. I said, tell me, mama, what's it all about? We're waiting on Roosevelt, son. Roosevelt, Roosevelt, just waiting on Roosevelt. Sister got sick and the doctor wouldn't come because we couldn't pay him the proper sum. I waiting on Roosevelt, 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 I waiting on Roosevelt. Then one day they put us out the house. Ma and Pa was meek as a mouth, still waiting on Roosevelt, Roosevelt, Roosevelt. But when they felt those cold winds blow and they didn't have no place to go, Paul said, I'm tired of waiting on Roosevelt, Roosevelt, Roosevelt. Damn tired of waiting on Roosevelt. I can't get a job and I can't get no grub. Backbone and navel doing the belly rub. A waiting on Roosevelt, Roosevelt, Roosevelt. And a lot of other folks was hungry and cold and stopped believing what they'd been told by Roosevelt, Roosevelt, Roosevelt because the pot's still empty and the cupboard's still bare, and you can't build a bungalow out of air. Mr. Roosevelt, listen, what's the matter here? <laughs> okay, Kathleen, go ahead, please. Um, okay, I mentioned Hurston before, just coming back to this Roosevelt thing. I believe she took advantage of one of the New Deal things and went south to, uh, she, she was an anthropologist and do work. And I believe um, Hughes went with her. I'm not positive about this. Maybe, uh, maybe you know, to do work on the culture of African-Americans in, in the South. Right, I think it had to do with interviewing oral histories, interviewing yes. people in the South. Um, the poem that he wrote, Waiting on Roosevelt, this one that was just read, remember that Langston Hughes very often speaks in the voice of his neighbors. He doesn't necessarily speak in his own voice always mm -hmm. because he was a little bit better off uh, with his writing income than a lot of people were in the depression. So, you know, that that is something uh, that is, is so. Um, Let's see, there are two more poems. Well, I think at this point, would you play, please, Liz, slide 17? This is about his positive attitude and his dream for this country. <laughs> I Dream a World by Langston Hughes, one of the greatest artistic thought leaders of the 21st century. He says, I dream a world where man, no other man, will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where 
all will know sweet freedom's way where greed no longer saps the soul nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every man is free where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl attends the needs of all mankind. Of such I dream my world. we have a couple of minutes left. I feel bad because I didn't even, he is such a vast poet. He writes about war. He writes about the treatment of black youth. He writes about everything. And I didn't even get to some of the things that I had. I got to just a, a bit of it, but I urge you to read, you know, The Panther and the Lash, which is one of his books. Uh, simple, you know, simple speaks his mind. Um, also, uh, I suggest um, the Big C, which is his autobiography. The reason it's called the Big C is because he worked as a sailor for a while, going to different ports around the world. So, um, any final comments at all? I wish, you know, but I'd I'd need two more hours <laughs> to do this. So. Our time is up, unfortunately. Any other comments at all? I don't see anything in the in the chat, but if anybody wants to chime in. Okay, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh Elise. Oh, Elise. I just want to thank you for for all of this. Um it he's been one of my favorites uh for decades and uh, this uh revival of interest in him means a lot to me. Thank you. I'll second that. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed it. That's, let's see if there's anybody, everybody says thank you. It was very informative. Thank you very much. You're wonderful. Susan, thank you again for thank you very much. doing uh, lectures and workshops for us. Thank you for joining everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. Care.